this all there is? It's exhausting sometimes. But, if, but we will never rest until we rest in him. The dignity of man rests above all on the fact that he is called to communion with God. This invitation to converse with God is addressed to man as soon as he comes into being. As soon as he comes into being. And when is that? When did you come into being? Conception. At conception, the invitation to, for you to converse with God was given to you at your conception. He created you in the deepest, darkest, warmest place in your mother's womb surrounded by a strong muscle to protect you, nourishment from her body, the heartbeat to soothe you, and placed beneath her heart. What, a more, what more beautiful place to invite you into his love. And yet, it's one of the most dangerous places to be in our world today. A third of those babies are called too early. But that's when we were first called and he ceaselessly continues to call us in. We are created for that relationship. For if man exists, it is because God has created him through love and through love continues to hold him in existence, he cannot live fully according to truth unless he freely acknowledges that love and entrusts himself to his creator. It's not enough to look at that crucifix and say, oh, thanks, Jesus. Good job. Woohoo! That's not enough. It's not enough to even come to Mass and go to reconciliation once a week and, and do all the things, the rosary every day. It's not enough. He doesn't call us to do all the things. He calls us into relationship. And that's what these men and women and children all had before they took that last breath and entered into eternity. My question for you in your hearts is, and for me, I'm certainly not there yet, but I, I have the hope that it can happen, that there's such a thin veil. John Paul II talks about this, this thin veil between earth and heaven. And, and it's like a veil is you can see through it. There are things we see in this world that give us glimpses of heaven. But that last breath, that's all it is. I had an experience when I, I okay, so my kids are still little. They're 10 to 3, six of them, all in that chunk. And, <laughs> But when we, they were even littler, I think we had four of them, and it was just impossible to get to Mass. It's still impossible to get to Mass on time. But we went to um, my parents' cabin in, in Otter Tail, and there's a little tiny lake church um, called St. James. And there's, uh, it's kind of, it's a lot smaller than St. Patrick's, but you know how St. Pat's has the main body of the church, and then there's the glass doors, and then the whole area where, we, where the Christmas people come. And we set up chairs back there, <laughs> or the babies, <laughs> the babies. Um, so it's like that, only, um, you know, they don't usually use the back half unless it was summer. So they set up these creaky metal chairs, which are awesome for little kids during mass. Not. 
really. But anyway, we got there late, of course, and so we're sitting on these metal chairs and we're sitting in the back and on these crackly speakers with all the, the readings and the music and, and everything. And we're going up to communion and we're moving very slowly, walking up to communion and they're singing the song over these crackly speakers. And I got to the doorway and I stepped in and all of a sudden it went from crackly, really bad speakers sounding music to loud, live music. And it took my breath away and I just went, oh. and I heard the words, that's all it is, is one step. And I knew that God was showing me there's not much between here and here. And it's the difference between really bad sound that you think might be kind of good, and then <laughs> you see the live performance and you get to hear it real, for real. If our relationship with Jesus Christ is one where I've placed my heart in his and he has given me his heart already, that step beyond that veil won't be very different. It'll be my last breath in his heart and my first glimpse of eternity in his heart. If we don't have that, then what? That last breath becomes a little bit or a lot more scary. That's where the fear is going to get us. We won't have fear. He has promised us that. I have heard um, a statistic recently that 48% of people who consider themselves Catholic do not believe or are not convinced that they can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Half. The Catholic Church is the only church in the entire world that has the true body, blood, soul, and divinity the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ himself at every single mass, every single day, not just on Sundays, in every Catholic church around the world. No other denomination can claim that. And in every Eucharistic miracle that has happened, where the, the host actually turns to visible flesh, because it always turns to flesh, but when it turns to visible flesh and they've done studies on it, it's heart tissue of a man from the Middle East. Heart tissue. He literally gives us his heart at every single mass. Jump up and down with me. This is amazing. This is amazing. And we go to mass and we say, well, I didn't really get much out of that. Is it worth going today? I'm so tired. Is the heart of Jesus not enough? He calls us. He, see, he never ceases to draw us. And he says, this is for you. And he has told saints, if I had done this only for you, I would do it again just for you, just for one soul to be with him in eternity. Oh, that is a love letter, a true love. And these saints are going to give us stories to hold on to. And our children learn from stories, right? So much more than just reading the Bible. They learn from stories. These pictures hang in our playroom. And my kids know all of them. They know their stories. That's how they learn. So if we can share these with them, 
we're, we're going to be golden. So now I'm, we're going to go to the, the sheet. And I, I, I should have said this already. I apologize because I made this myself. I'm a teacher. I'm a geek about, about saints. I love them. And I wanted to, I didn't mean to make it hard. I really didn't. I'm, I meant to make it interesting. So this isn't something for you to feel horrible about if you only got three, like my husband, right before I gave it to the first group last Wednesday. And he was like, ah, uh, I didn't really get any of them. And I was like, oh, well, that's good to know. <laughs> so I'm sorry, you made it hard. I, just, I should have said that straight up. But anyway. Um, I tried to make it interesting. A lot of these are saints that you have heard a lot about, maybe. But these details are different. So, um, number one. Jesus asked me for a drink of water, but no one is sure if I actually gave it to him. He spoke to me and looked at me with such love. I converted many in my town, including my five sisters and two sons, and all of us were tortured under Emperor Nero. No kids? Or do we have kids in here? I was skinned alive, and we were all martyred on the same day. Anybody know? She's not named in the Bible, but we know her from tradition and history outside of the Bible. But she, she was the woman at the well, St. Fotina. This woman went to the well at the noon of the day, which is the hottest part of the day. Everyone else in their right mind would go in the morning when it was cool. They would get their water, they would go back home. This woman knew that. And she would only go at the noon of the day because she had five husbands. And the man she was with now was not actually her husband. And she was ridiculed, and she was made fun of, and she had been used and abused, and she had, n even though she had five husbands, she had never really been seen by the heart of a man. She'd been looked at plenty of times. And she'd been made fun of and mocked. So in her right mind, no way is she going at eight in the morning. She's going to go at noon. And she didn't think anyone else was going to be there. And Jesus and his apostles aren't supposed to go through Samaria. They're supposed to go around because they're good Jews. But Jesus said, no, we're going through. And then he sent his disciples off to, I don't know, run an errand or something. And he's sitting there alone with this woman. And he asks her for a drink. And she's already skeptical. What do you want to drink for? Why are you asking me? I'm a woman. You're not supposed to be talking to me. I'm Samaritan. You're not supposed to be talking to a Samaritan. What's, what do you want from me now? And he says, I thirst for you. I see you. I see your heart. I see your shame. I see how much you hate yourself and how much everyone else hates you and I love you and I'm here and I am here the noon of the day only with you because I see you and I want you. And if you read that straight through in the Bible, it's less than three minutes if you read it slowly. I timed it. And in three minutes, she went from social outcast, abused woman, don't talk to me, woman. And she dropped her bucket and ran back into the town and told everyone, everyone, even the people who hurt her the most, about the man who saw her heart who is the living, true God. And they were like, uh, I don't know. No, they believed because she just said it. In less than three minutes, 
she went from hopeless and nothing and mucky shame to a glorified woman who said yes to Christ and kept saying yes, even when it meant that her and her two sons and her five sisters would be tortured and tortured and tortured and then eventually skinned alive because of her new husband that she received. Saint Fotina, her feast date is March 20th and she is a great friend. Number two, the book the Journey of Our Love, written by my husband and daughter, is a collection of my letters to my husband and his to me. I was a medical doctor, pediatrician, and loved dressing like a lady. I, she said, I trust in God, yes, but now it is up to me to fulfill my duty as a mother. I renew to the Lord the offer of my life. I am ready for everything to save my baby. St. Gianna Bredamola, yes. She died in 1962. Her husband was at her canonization and her kids. How cool is that? She, um, I have read some of the letters and frankly, I was pretty bored. <laughs> I was hoping for this glorious explanation of how she was a wife and a mother and a saint all at once. And I was like, oh my gosh. This is, she's like describing my life. We went to the beach today and he built a sand castle and then we went home. And I fed him lunch, and he spilled it all over the floor, so I cleaned it up, times six. And then I went to give him an, a nap, and he slept. <laughs> I'm like, where's the glory here? <laughs> but at the same time, how beautiful. She's a saint, and that was her life. She had three beautiful children, and then when she was pregnant with her fourth, they told her she had cancer. They told her, you should abort. You should have a hysterectomy. She said, no way. No way. And she refused all treatments. She was a, she was a doctor. She knew what was going to happen. She refused all treatments until the baby was born, but by then it was too late, and she died six days after her baby was born. One, I know at least one of her daughters and maybe a son travel around the world now speaking about her. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. I have not heard them. But. Number four. Oh, I love this one. I said, the body, in fact, and it alone, is capable of making visible that which is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. I love art, traveling, reading, and writing. 16 books, 14 encyclicals, 7 plays, 3 poems, and number 2, stop apostolic letters, and too many exhortations to count and one of my plays became a movie. Yes, John Paul II, this guy here. The body, okay, first of all, can I just get a show of hands if you have, if you have even heard about theology of the body? Have you heard of this? Oh, well, that's more than the other groups. Awesome. If you don't know about theology of the body, you gotta. It saved me. I am not even kidding. When I was in college, I had a very, what I know now to be, a very warped idea of what it meant to be a woman, to be feminine, of what it meant to, uh, of my responsibility, let's say, in a relationship with a man what I was supposed to be like. And John Paul II wrote, he, he, when he became po Pope, he made a mission to write the theology of the body. And he wrote from 1978 to 1984, all of his Wednesday audiences, he read the theology of the body to the world. That's when I was like two totally dating myself here, but still, in this room, we had four people, five people raise their hand. We need this more than ever, the theology of the body, that your body reveals God to you and to the world. 
your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your belly button. I'm not even kidding. It tells you where you came from and where you're going. I can't get, this would be a whole like years of talks, but this is the gist of it. All of these things, the way your body was created and especially your genitals. Good job not flinching. <laughs> especially your genitals. Reveal God. As a woman, it's different than a man. Obviously, our bodies look different. And in and of themselves, they don't really make sense. But you put them together and they make sense. Marriage is the sacrament that we receive. Every time my husband and I have intercourse, as long as we're not contracepting, we get grace. That's when we receive grace. It's not at our wedding and that's it. It's every time we have intercourse. It's, re it's not renewable, it's, it's a continuous gift of grace that God gives us. Did you know that the altar at church, the church has always said, is the marriage bed of Christ with his church? Where Jesus gives himself to his bride, us. He gives his heart to his bride. Christopher West is the lay person who has dedicated his entire life to sharing theology of the body in a layman's terms. So I would not go directly to theology of the body because it's like this thick, it's super dense, I can't even read it. I have it on my shelf, I don't read it. I go to Christopher West. My husband and I just saw him last week. He was in town and we had a date night. It was lovely. It was awesome. So remember it. Write it down. Theology of the Body. It's amazing. Our library at St. Pat's has several books of Christopher West. Some of them are a little bit older, but you can get the newer ones on Amazon. The good news about sex and marriage, I have here the new one. The one that's in there it only has 115 questions. It's question answer format. Super easy. The one um, that I have here is 150, it's the newer version, so. Okay, um, sorry, five to seven, okay. Did I skip? Oh, you can't skip number three, thank you. My little way means love and trust in God. I said, when I die, I will send down a shower of roses. Oh, I gave this one away, didn't I? From the heavens. I will spend my heaven doing good upon earth. My parents were the first married couple to be canonized saints at the same time. St. Therese. If you go in our Adoration Chapel, hopefully regularly, um, <clears throat> Father Bloom had the, the two paintings commissioned. And so when you're looking at Jesus, there's the two, they're like windows to heaven with saints. And this side has um, Therese kind of on the bottom, and then St. Louis and St. Zaley Martin were her parents, Martine, whatever. But anyway, Martin is how the Americans say it. Um, Zaley was a lace maker, so she's got the lacy collar. And Louis is standing right behind her in like a French military garb thing. So, um, yeah, St. Therese. And her, her picture is right back there under the clock. That's her as a little girl. So cute. Okay, number five. Sorry. After dad died, I died defending my purity. Because of it, mom had to place my older s other siblings for adoption. I visited my attacker in jail after her death, offering him flowers of purity and my forgiveness. And his conversion led him to attending my canonization with my mom. Maria, Maria Goretti, yes. Very, very long story made short. She was nine when her dad died from meningitis. They, her family lived on a farm, um, and they, they worked in the fields in order to live on 
in the, in the house that was owned by the people who owned the, all the land. There was another man and his son who lived with them. And um, when Maria's dad died, her mom had to go work in the fields, otherwise they would have lost their house and everything. So Maria, Maria, Maria's mom had to go work in the fields. Maria stayed home, and she looked after the other kids and took care of the cleaning and the housework and all this when she was nine. Um, when she was 11, okay, so Alessandro was the, was the boy and his dad who lived with them. The dad was a drunk, and he um, was addicted to pornography, and he bought pornography for himself and gave it to his son. So, Alessandro, warped by this pornography and having this little girl in the home, starts making advances towards her. And when she was 11 and he was 20, he came in early from the fields one day. And she was sewing one of his shirts. And he said, Maria, this is what's going to happen right now. And she said, no, Jesus does not want this. And he said, this is going to happen. And he started to force her. And she kept saying, no, no, no. And he started to choke her. I'll be careful. Um, she said, she was able to, to, to say, I would rather die than give in to you. And he said, OK. And he grabbed a, a thing, I, like a steak kind of thing, and stabbed her five times. She passed out on the floor. He went to his room. She comes to and starts crawling across the floor to try to get help. He hears her and comes out, grabs the instrument, stabs her nine more times to make sure she's dead. He stabbed her so hard that the iron instrument that he used, when it hit her backbone, it bent. She gets to the hospital, and they're doing surgery on her, but she's so full of holes that they can't give her any anesthesia. And when the priest comes to bring her her Lord, she can't receive him. And she asks for water, and the doctor says, no, we can't give you water, Maria. And she says to the priest, Father, I'm so thirsty. And he says to her, Maria, our Lord on the cross asked for a drink of water and no one gave it to him either. Can you offer this for the salvation of sinners' souls? And this 11-year-old girl says, yes. And she didn't complain one more time or cry on the operating table with no anesthesia. She said yes to Jesus and kept saying yes. She did die that day. Alessandro got 30 years in prison and was not a model prisoner. He was angry. It was rambunctious. He was causing trouble all over the place. He still refused to say that he actually did anything wrong. And he said Maria came at him, and he was defending himself. The judge knew better. Everyone else knew better. He was 20-year-old, 11-year-old. And six years into his prison stay, he's in his cell, and Maria appears to him in his cell. And she has 14 white lilies. And she stands in front of him, and without saying a word, one by one hands him each of the lilies. And he said, when I took them, my hands burned. And he had no doubt in his mind that she was offering him her purity because in our faith the lilies mean purity and her forgiveness because she offered him one lily for each time he had stabbed her and he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that she wanted him to be with her in heaven 
he was converted completely on the spot. He immediately called for the priest to do a sacrament of reconciliation, and he became a model prisoner and converted people in prison. He was let out three years early on good behavior, and the first thing he did was go to find Asunta, Maria's mom. Now, Maria was the caretaker while the mom worked in the fields. So now that Maria was gone, there were no other children to take care of the kids. She had to give all of them away and just learn to survive. She was illiterate. illiterate. She couldn't even sign her name. She had to just survive. The first thing he did when he left that day is he went to go find, find her. And he found her, and he knocked on her door, and she answered, and he said, Asunta, do you know who I am? And she said, yes, you are, you are Alessandro. And he said, yes. He said, Maria has appeared to me, and she has offered me her forgiveness. And I went to confession, and God has forgiven me. And now I'm here to ask you to beg you for your forgiveness. And she looks at him and says, well, if Maria can forgive you and God can forgive you, who am I to not forgive you? And she gave him a hug. The way the story goes, I saw one place where this was written, is that it was Christmas Eve, and she was going to Christmas Eve Mass, and so she invited him to come along with her. And they knelt down and received the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord next to each other in that church that night. I'm not saying I'm there yet, if that had been me. But I do know that grace is given when we need it. And because of Maria Goretti, she is helping many, many women find their ground again after things that have happened to them like that. And forgiveness is the only thing that's going to keep us from being bitter. Forgiveness is why he died. What year was St. Maria? Roughly, let's see. I think, did I write it down? I have all, I have, see, these are my notes. I'm not going by my notes. Um, he died, Alessandra died in 1970. She died in 1902. Mm -hmm. And her feast day, her feast day is July 6th. Um, there is talk about uh, Alessandro, he ended up be going into a, um, a lay capuchin order, I believe, um, and worked there the rest of his life offering penance. And his letters are beautiful. And he had such devotion to St. Maria Goretti, he called her his little saint. You guys, if the power of the blood can turn hearts like that, why would we not say yes? Ah, it just, it's amazing to think. Number six, one of my titles is Terror of Demons. How about them apples? Anybody know? St. Joseph himself. St. Joseph himself, terror of demons. Yes, patron of fathers, yes, patron of families, yes, patron of the universal church, yes. Terror of demons, yes. So if you feel plagued by evil spirits, it's very real. It's not a weird thing, it's a very real thing. If you feel that, go to St. Joseph, and he will lead you in the direction to becoming free from those. That's all I have time to say about that, I apologize. Uh, he's the one to go to to start out with that. 
Number seven, I'm responsible for the death of the first, it's actually second, I think, martyr, because St. John the Baptist, but Jesus was still alive, so after Jesus died, first martyr. Blinded by the light, I converted completely. I'm also responsible for 14 books in the Bible and the conversion of thousands of souls over the centuries. Blinded by the light was your clue. St. Paul, yes. Number eight, I was justly condemned for my actions as a criminal, but looking into Jesus' eyes changed me forever. He saw my sorrow, and I asked Jesus to remember me in his mercy. He promised me eternity. What a merciful, loving God. Also, he's, he's in the Bible, but not named. The good thief, St. Dismas. Mm -hmm. Gestas was the name of the bad thief. Um, I was talking to my kids. I, I brought them to confession a couple weeks ago, and afterwards we were talking about forgiveness and confession and stuff. And I, and I said, you know, Peter and Judas lived the same life with Jesus those three years. They walked together, they walked with him, they heard the same stories, they, they met the same people, they both saw Jesus take two fish, is it two fish and five loaves of bread? And multiply it for thousands, and then have 12 baskets left over. They both saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after three days. If that doesn't convince you, what will? They're walking the same road for three years. They both betrayed Jesus the night before he died. What's the difference? Why is St. Peter a saint and Judas is not? Anybody know? Repentance. Repentance. Peter said, I'm sorry and I love you. And Judas didn't think that he could be forgiven. And he hung himself despair. Believing you can't be forgiven of a sin is the one sin that can't be forgiven. I'm going to say that again. Believing that you cannot be forgiven of your sin is the one sin that can't be forgiven if you don't give it to Christ. He transforms, not us. Jesus transforms, not us. And reconciliation is where that happens. So I'm talking about this. And my six-year-old says, yeah, Mom, like, like the guys on the cross. And I said, yeah? And he said, yeah, like when Jesus was on the cross and the bad guy made fun of Jesus and yelled at him, I said, yeah? And he said it. But then the other guy didn't. He, he was nice to him. And I said, yeah. And he said, and he said, sorry. Yeah. I said, and what did Jesus say? And Greg said, he said, you will be with me in heaven. It's that simple. In his six-year-old mind, that simplicity, it's really that simple for us. And we make it so darn freaking complicated. It's not. It's us not forgiving ourselves, I think, a lot more than him not being able to forgive us. Jesus, why don't you? Jesus, why don't you? Where are you, God? We need to show up. And we need to say, I'm sorry. And we need to get to that confessional and go. I give it to you because I can't do it anymore. That's when he transforms. And that's when he calls us into that Trinity relationship. And that's when our journey to sainthood begins. I have to talk faster now or less. I'm not sure which. Um, okay. Number nine, I don't have a whole lot to say about him because there's not a lot out there about him yet, but I tried robbing a currency dealer. The deal went bad and I killed a cop in 1954. I was jailed and couldn't take care of my wife, my daughter, or pregnant mistress. I read St. Therese's Story of a Soul 
when he was in prison, and my heart was converted. I wrote many letters regarding my conversion and was executed by guillotine in 1957 on St. Therese's feast day, October 1st. He's, Jacques. yes, <laughs> Jacques Fesch. He is a servant of God, SOG, is servant of God, so he, he, they have opened the process for canonization, but he's not officially canonized, or blessed even. <clears throat> um, I don't know a whole lot more about him, but the last thing he wrote was, in five hours, I will see Jesus before he was executed. Um, if you Google him, you'll find stuff out there. But um, Number 10, I met my husband at age 18, mothered three children, two of whom died within 30 minutes of being born. I was pregnant with number three when I was diagnosed with cancer on my tongue. I refused treatment that would endanger my son and died on June 13, 2012 in my wedding gown. Another servant of God, yes, Chiara Corbella Patria. She got pregnant with her first and ultrasound revealed, if I can say it correctly, that the baby had an encephaly, where the brain, part of the brain doesn't form, it's just empty inside. So they knew the baby wouldn't live, they tried to get her to have an abortion, she said no. And so the baby lived a half an hour and they were able to be, have the baby baptized um, by the priest that married them. They got pregnant with number two. Ultrasound revealed that the baby had no legs, no kidneys, and the lungs would not be able to develop. They said, you should abort. She said, no. They both said no. The baby lived 38 minutes, and the dad walked the baby's body down to the morgue himself in the hospital. She got pregnant with number three, and ultrasound revealed a perfectly healthy baby. And then her fifth month of pregnancy, they found the carcinoma. She refused all treatments to save the life of her baby. She was able to live about a year, and they tried all sorts of treatments and things like this, and at, at one point, the doctor went to Enrico, her husband, and said, We've done all we can. This is terminal, and she's going to die. And so in the hospital, he brought her to the chapel in front of the Blessed Sacrament where Jesus was present, and he told her, you are going to die. And right there, they renewed their wedding vows. Oh. A month later, they were able to meet Pope Benedict XVI. And a month later, she got into her wedding dress. This woman who knew so much about marriage. And she waited for her bridegroom, her true spouse. Isn't that beautiful? God calls us into relationship, and our marriages here are just a glimmer of that relationship with him. That's what he calls us to. She knew this. 2012 wasn't that long ago. These are real people. It's so amazing. Number 11, my dad was atheist and my mom was a social Catholic. I was always the life of the party wherever I went. I loved mountain climbing and sports. One of my favorite pastimes was going to the pool hall and betting people, and if I won, they would, come to, they would get to come with me to adoration. Versalalto. Here's Giorgio Versati. This is my guy. Back there, back corner. I fell in love with him when I was like 22 or something, and part of it was that he's good looking. And, part of, and I was single, and not, okay, that's, this is getting weird. That's not what I'm meaning, though. But that, that there is a possibility at age 21 of finding a really cool, good-looking Catholic guy. So, Pier Giorgio Frassati. He died in 1924, so I missed the boat on that one. But, um, but I, I was able to go to Rome uh, 
I don't even know what year it was. Two, I don't know. I'm not even going to guess. But anyway, I got to meet his niece, Wanda. I got to have lunch with her. And if you look, it's hard to see, but he's holding, he's mountain climbing here in this picture, and he's holding a big ice pick. I got to hold that in my hands. It was so cool. It was so cool. I, um, with two other people, started the Frasati Society of Minnesota, which is still going now for young adults, based out of St. Paul. At the time, I was attending Coon Rapids Epiphany, and um, Father Reiser asked, heard about this, and he asked me to start one at Epiphany. Totally different crowd, you guys. St. Paul, young adults, Coon Rapids, not so much. So it, it floundered, man, and it pretty much flopped, except my sister and I planned a, a Boundary Waters trip for two groups of nine people. And my friend went on a blind date um, with a guy the week before. For 45 minutes, they had coffee. And she told him about this, and he thought he might want to come. And I thought, wow, either he's really psycho wanting to go to Boundary Waters, because you go in, you don't come out until you're done with the trip. Five days with t perfect strangers. So I, th I thought, either he's crazy or he's totally in love with her and wants to marry her. So on my 30th birthday, we meet in the Epiphany parking lot, and I see this guy, and I think, oh my gosh. No, he came for her. He came for her. So I spent the whole trip thinking, he came for her. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. <laughs> His eyes were just so amazing. Turns out he did not come for her. He just wanted to meet more Catholic young adults because he didn't know any. And we had our first date a week and a half later. And I don't worry. I called her. I talked with her. She was kind of okay with it mostly. But <laughs> he's my husband now. So Pier Giorgio is who I attribute our marriage to. Our, so our oldest son is named Peter after him. Um, number 12, I was a spitfire total like it was. I was a mystic. Ecstasy is very cool. A reformer and political activist and super into, super into religious and political affairs of the church. She said, be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. St. Catherine of Siena. And number 13, I lived in Andover, worked at a turkey farm, and was homeschooled. I was a Boy Scout, altar server, and attended Youth U2000 retreats. I loved riding my horses and helping my family on our farm. All I wanted was to be a priest. I was hit by a car and killed in the year 2000 in front of my home. There have been efforts to begin my canonization. His parents and brother attend St. Patrick's. Charles Nuts. No, Charles <laughs> Unz. <laughs> And if you drive on, high, on 7, and you'll see this big, huge picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Have you seen that? That's the spot he died. And for years, where his head lied, laid, um, there was a circle where grass didn't grow. And I'm not sure if that's still the case, but I know for at least eight years that was the case. And they put rocks around that spot, and it was just brown. And everything else around it was green. Um, in Andover, right in front of his house. Is it across the turkey farm? Like yeah, he worked at. He was going to work at the turkey farm when a car came around under the influence at six in the morning and hit him, and he flew a hundred feet and landed in the ditch. So here's my invitation to you. Ellen does not know that I'm inviting you, but she invites everybody. So at their house, if you find that Guadalupe. On March 20th, the day he died, which is also St. Fotina's feast day, the, at 3.30 they do Stations of the Cross in the back behind their house, and they have an altar s set up with a huge awning and, chair and chairs and benches and stuff, and they have a mass said. The postulator that they, for his cause, comes usually from Kansas, and they, he does mass, Father Island goes, usually um, Father Tom, who used to be at Epiphany, goes, and anyone can come, including children, rain or shine, but if you stay for the potluck, you have to bring food. So March 20th, 3.30 is stations, 4 o'clock is mass, if you can make it. It's awesome. He, they didn't, he didn't attend here. Charles was at Epiphany, so that's where he was the altar server and everything. Um, but going through this list, you can see there's, no, there's nothing the same about these people except that they received Jesus freely into their hearts. They said yes and kept saying yes. 
They are our friends. They just wait. Saints have said this, that, or when they were on earth, people have said, the saints just wait for us to call on them. They got nothing else to do up there, but pray for us. Use them. And there you can be patron, they, they, you can have patron saints, birthday saints, the saint um, of your name, the saint um, of your baptism day. I happen to struggle with, with anger as one of my, one of my, my temper is one of my things. You know, I have, I have things that just pop up and I just react. It's one of my flaws. And I was, I was having a bad mom day and I was, I was something, I don't know, it was probably water or fire. And I got angry and I just went, oh, and I said, okay, who's the patron saint of anger? And St. Jerome popped into my head and he was, he was known as the son of thunder. <laughs> Thank God that's not my name. But I was, th I was like, oh, that would be embarrassing to be the patron saint of anger because everyone would know that sin. And then I thought, no, how glorious that you can have such a horrible sin and still be a saint. And, and that's, your, that's what you're patron of. I don't know if that's like, <laughs> too bad, buddy, you got this one. <laughs> but that gives me hope. Because if I give it to him, he can transform that. It's his now. He took it on himself. It's his. We have such hope. And our world needs hope, doesn't it? Our children. If we can't have hope ourselves, how in the world are we going to teach our children? You can make it through high school because I'm going to teach you theology of the body and how much your body is worth and how you need to be respected. Mary Magdalene, another woman never seen in her heart by a man until Christ. St. Therese, I just want it all. 24, she's the doctor of the church, one of four women doctors of the church. She died when she was 24. She had an education up till she was 14. And she's a doctor of the church. These are our friends. And the veil is so thin. I have felt them next to me. The last thing I have for you is, maybe you've seen it. It's been floating around Facebook quite a bit. I'm, I don't mean to block Jesus out of your view, but this is a very limited screen here. And I'm just going to check the volume. Um, I'm going to turn it up. Okay. So then we go, oh, this is a tricky mouse here. Has anyone seen this yet? Yeah, okay. Have sight, your faith has saved you. 
The Gospel of the Lord. So with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory. As with one voice we claim the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. single mass, he comes to the marriage bed. And all he asks is for us to show up and say, this is what I got. This is all I got. You do the rest. All the saints, all the angels at every mass throughout the world today, Right now, somewhere, there is Mass, and they're praying for our world. They're praying for us. This is our faith. Be the 52% that is convinced of what he did for you. What if St. Patrick's turned into that? Is that a great place to raise your kids? 
Yeah. To raise them to be saints with a capital S. And Christ looks into your heart and he sees you. He sees the muck and he sees your deepest, ugliest, pussiest wounds. And he says, I want to heal that right there. And sometimes it hurts just a little and sometimes it hurts a heck of a lot. But when that's healed, we can be glorified with him, in him, through him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, in relationship with him. Because you are made in the image and likeness of himself. And your body reveals his divinity. In your baptism, you are, you are worth everything he died for, and you've gained everything he won. Adoration Chapel is open right now. Bring your kids. You can be this close to Jesus Christ face to face and you can say, this is what I got. I'm going to tell you like it is and he can handle it. And you can say, this is what I want and he can handle it. He might give it to you, he might not. He knows what's best. Yes, no, not yet. But, but he is here and he never ceases to draw close to you and wait for you. Thank you very much. If you want to look at some of these books, the, oh, the last, okay, so one more thing. I'm so sorry, I know it's late. Saintly solutions for life's common problems. You struggle with, it says from anger, boredom and temptation, gluttony, gossip and greed. And you, you just look it up and let's family difficulties and then it goes through all the saints that had family difficulties and how they overcame it anger boredom distrust all these things if you want to take a look that's awesome and then this one the good news about sex and marriage and all that goodness is right here you want to make your marriage better with that side of things this will help and it comes from a pope St. Louis Marie de Montfort said, the quickest way to become a saint is to consecrate yourself to Mary, the queen of all saints. This, I would not start with St. Louis Marie de Montfort's because it is intense, it's a lot, it's heavy, and it's hard. This is easy. 33 days, each meditation takes maybe five to seven minutes. Written by Father Michael Gately. So if you want to look at any of these books, please do. Take pictures of them, buy them, whatever. So anyway, thank you. Questions I'll take afterwards. Thank you.